All right, you creepy bug, get out of my way. What? Do you have any idea how much this cost? Crunchy piece of crap. Listen up, dungeon crawling nerds. Let's talk rust monsters. For everyone else, feel free to ignore the window dressing. This is going to be mainly about historical weapons. So you shall be edumacated or just entertained. I don't know. It's going to be fun. Relax. It's cool. All right, for those who don't know, rust monsters in Dungeons and Dragons are a medium monstrosity with natural armor that feeds on metal. I'm just going by snippets I can find online. So veteran D&D &D players, if you take issue with anything I'm about to say, feel free to go, eh, actually, nobody's gonna read it, but hey, feel free. Angry typing ensues. <laughs> Jokes aside, at least for a while, so rust monsters, what do they do? Well, they can corrode metal within reach of them, and by touching it with their antennae, antennae, whatever, uh, within a right radius of five feet or one and a half meters. Step one in overthinking all of this will be workarounds and loopholes. So the thing needs to touch the weapons within a limited radius, right? So why not range the weapons? You know, throwing spears, axes, arrows, bolts, etc., etc. Well, the source material mentions that non-magical ammunition made of metal that hits the rust monster is destroyed after dealing damage. But that begs the question, why does that not happen to melee weapons? Because that makes it sound like the body of the thing itself is corrosive, xenomorph blood style, which would make sense, but then any metal weapon that hits it and does damage should corrode. I don't know what's up with that, but hey, maybe it's an oversight, maybe it's for gameplay balance, I don't know. All right, so rust, AKA iron oxide, affects only ferrous, iron containing metals, uh, but that's not the only material that can corrode. Uh, aluminum, for example, doesn't rust, but can corrode, particularly in seawater. Different metals have different corrosion resistances. For example, stainless steel has a relatively high corrosion resistance, but it's not impervious. It can rust over time, just less so. Uh, exceptionally corrosion resistant are red metals. So copper and its alloys, bronze and brass. All oxidization does to those really is turn them green, which is why you find remarkably well-preserved bronze artifacts from a long time ago. Apparently rust monsters prefer ferrous metals, but that doesn't mean that they can't corrode non-ferrous metals, although technically they shouldn't be able to corrode bronze because that's just not what naturally happens. Of course, if bronze is an option, we have all kinds of possibilities from ax and spear heads to sword blades. You can do a lot with that. Now, of course, a, sword, a bronze sword isn't as good as one made of steel and against a naturally armored enemy, this may not be ideal because the, the edge would damage relatively easily. However, if you think about a bronze mace, no problem with that at all. It's just a solid piece. You know, even if it gets scuffed up more easily than iron or steel, who cares, right? It's just, it's just a lump of metal at the end of a stick. It's not easy to damage in any meaningful way. So you could whack away not worry about it at all. But let's assume a super rust monster that can corrode all metals with every part of its body magically. So it doesn't matter if it touches them with its antennae or with its whatever, with its ass for all I care. What could a party of heroes pick to counter that? Well, it can't hurt you if you crush the damn bug first, right? So offense. One simple thing that comes to mind is a wooden spear. As an interesting side note, there is a research article that found that fire hardening a spear only slightly increases the hardness, but makes the tip more prone to breaking off. 
Did you know that? I didn't. So a stone-tipped spear, or arrows for that matter, might be a better option. However, flint, chert, and especially obsidian, although hard, are somewhat brittle, so they may be likely to be damaged on the carapace of a rust monster, which has a natural armor rating of 14, which uh, in the source material is similar to ring mail, not a real thing, and scale armor. So we might need something more durable. For the same reason, a stone disc mace may also not be ideal. I've talked about those in another video. If you haven't seen that yet, clicky right here, upper right corner or in the description. And you, you see on surviving disc maces, you see quite a bit of damage here and there chipping and uh, some are broken. So may not be ideal. So what, what can we do? Something sturdier. How about a Tetsubo or a Kanabo, which is a type of studded club from Japan. So this thing has iron studs, but I'm pretty sure it's not dependent on those studs. I mean, if we look at this thing right here, this is a quarter staff, a particularly thick one, octagonal. This is massive. So hitting something with this, you know, whether or not there would be studs here, I don't think you would care, quite frankly, if this smashes you over the head or over the carapace, whatever. By the way, for maximizing striking power, don't think of the way a bow staff is commonly used, you know, with the hands fairly close to the center and, you know, using both ends of the staff, but think more maximizing leverage. So both hands pretty low and just smash the hell out of the damn thing. That's, it's way harder. I almost forgot one obvious choice, the maul. This is primarily a tool for driving and fencing posts and other work, but it has also been used in war at times. They're sometimes fitted with iron rings or even an iron striking surface to reinforce it and prevent the wood from splitting. So if those were lost, the durability would decrease, but would probably still work pretty well. Another option would be an atlatl or spear thrower. These were used with very long throwing spears or darts. So they could be either stone tipped or just used with a wooden point. And you also have a pretty serviceable wooden club here as well. All right, if we look at indigenous populations, we have a large arsenal of highly effective weapons made without metal. If we look at the Maori of New Zealand, for instance, they have a number of really interesting weapons. I'm just going to mention two. Uh, one is the Mere, which is made of jade, aka greenstone. And this is an amazing display of craftsmanship. Just imagine the time and effort it takes to cut, shape, and polish stone until it becomes such a smooth, refined object. So these were ground into a sturdy edge all around, even on top, which is relevant for the use, because apparently, at least some of the time, they use them actually for thrusting, supposedly to avoid the risk of breaking them. But not exclusively, I imagine. They were probably also used for striking. These are remarkably short, between 25 and 50 centimeters, or 10 to 20 inches. Like most types of stone, jade is hard, but relatively brittle, so may not be ideal against an insectoid monster. Uh, now, there are other clubs, like the Wahaika, that was made of wood or whalebone. The short reach is a bit of a disadvantage. Either way, I couldn't just skip mentioning them. They're fascinating. Another Maori weapon is the Taiaha, which is a fighting staff with a spear-like rounded point on one end and a paddle-like striking surface on the other with tapered edges. And uh, these were made of dense hardwood. Uh, should be strong enough to smash a big bug or stab into the weak parts of the carapace. Looking at North America, First Nations people have plenty of highly effective war clubs. We have ball-headed clubs, for example, where the head was made from the root ball of a young tree. And there are also other types of this club that follow the natural shape of the root turning them into spike protrusions, basically. Some ball clubs were fitted with an iron stud or spike. That, of course, would be lost when fighting a rust monster, but uh, there are also a few examples with antler spikes, and you could easily do that. You could make a ball-headed club or another type and 
uh, insert a spike or stud or even an axe blade if you want made of bone or antler. There's also the famous Gunstock War Club and it has been debated whether its origin is just in mimicking the stocks on muskets that colonial Europeans brought or whether it already existed before. Uh, personally, I find it m most plausible to assume that a, at least a similar form of war club existed before and then it was seeing the stocks on those guns it was styled to look more like them but you know any kind of forward curved maybe even angled war club is not really that hard to come up with particularly considering that uh, they followed the natural curvature of wood so you have a natural tendency toward that anyway, which by the way makes it strong because that way the wood grain is aligned with the shape of the club. If you just cut it out of a plank, it can easily split on impact. And we've seen that in this video that I put up a couple of years ago. This type often has a metal blade attached to it, sometimes even multiple, but it would be perfectly effective without. And again, you could easily make one out of stone or bone. Stone bone? That sounds like a metal band. We are stone bone. There's also an intriguing First Nations war club, sometimes called a skull cracker or skull crusher, which is a tapered stone head fastened to a wooden shaft and wrapped in animal hide. So that's a pretty smart idea to also reinforce the wooden handle. If you tightly wrap it in soaked animal hide, which as it dries contracts, it will protect it from breaking or splitting. This would be devastating to hit something with. Just imagine this is almost like a stone war pick, essentially. So you would concentrate a lot of force at the end, at, at the small tip there. Then we've got the flop head or slung shot club, which consists of a stone load attached to a wooden handle with hide. So you have a flexible connection there in between like a flail. And in my video about flails, again, up here and link down below if you haven't seen it yet, I talked about one type from Russia which use striking heads of either metal or organic material like antler or bone and uh, they were attached to the wooden handle with braided cord and the same way you could also make a large pole flail or war flail uh, without metal simply by attaching the striking tip to the main pole with rope. Apparently there are no surviving First Nations war clubs from pre-colonial times, unfortunately, so that makes research a little tricky. Anyway, wouldn't you want a big ass club to crack the shell of an insectoid enemy? Okay, maybe not quite that big. Pacific Islanders came up with a wide variety of interesting designs. Some have triangular heads, some have paddle-like blades, some have serrations, some have spikes, etc., etc. There's a lot to dig into. Uh, some were even designed for throwing, like the Fijian Ula, which is basically a wooden maze that looks kind of like a war scepter. And yes, some are rather large. Personally, my guess is that impact weapons made of the densest available hardwoods are probably more durable than anything made of stone, because even though it's not as hard as stone, hardwoods can have plenty of resistance to shock and fracture. And also, it's a single piece, which is typically sturdier than multiple components fitted together. And of course, the more massive, the better. You know, like in this example here, this is a fairly average sized quarterstaff and this is the extra thick version. The more massive object is going to be stronger as demonstrated by this random driftwood club that I found one time and decided to test out it was some kind of unknown softwood most likely or maybe a softer type of hardwood like beech and it cracked eventually, but uh, until then, it was able to sustain some pretty hard blows against a steel helmet. They're absolutely gnarly looking weapons fitted with shark teeth 
and of course the Aztec Macuahuit with obsidian blades. Uh, these would be brutal against an unarmored human, but probably not durable enough against an insect-like enemy with natural armor. Although, even if the shark teeth or obsidian blades break or fall off, you could still use it as a blunt impact tool, of course. There are so many other examples, it's too much to cover, so I'm just going to leave it at that. But let's quickly also think about shields. Uh, because you would think, well, a shield is made of wood, no problem, right? Well, the problem is that the grip is usually nailed to the shield with iron nails. And of course, the boss here, in case of the center grip shield, protects the hand. And uh, even on strapped shields, the straps, again, are usually attached with metal. But as a viable alternative, you could use a shield with a wooden handle tied to it, which we see in some parts of the world. And there are also hide or leather shields that are used in many parts of the world. You find them in Africa, the Middle East, North America, India, etc., etc. Although some do have metal fittings, there are also woven wicker shields, which also don't use any metal, which you find in many parts of the world and different time periods. Archaeologists even found the 2,300 year old remains of a bark shield. So this was made of tree saplings or thin limbs and uh, covered in bark. Really awesome. Very interesting to see. Now, of course, this is not as durable as wood, but lighter, you know, just like wicker shields. So should be perfectly serviceable against a rust monster. That's what I've got. If you're wondering about protection without metal, I've made videos about leather and bone armor, fabric armor, duct tape armor, and a special kind of mail armor, aka envelopes, just paper glued together, which works fine if you do it well by compressing everything nicely, which I didn't, but they actually still work reasonably well. Uh, that's all going to be down, down there, along with the sources and, you know, Patreon, shameless self-promotion, yada, 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 blah, whatever. Yeah, we're done here. So thanks for watching and have a good one. The thing needs to touch the weapon with its wigglies. <laughs> its wigglies? Wow. Master dictionary right here. I'm a living dictionary. Yeah. So the first step in overthinking all of this will be worker, worker, worker. First step, turn into, I don't even know what, what makes sounds. A demented werewolf? I've talked about disc mesas before in another video. Clicky here, or is it here? One of the corners, I don't know. Shape and polish this to this. Fuck, 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 fuck.